Welcome to Brother GP. This is a quick top five video. So if you haven't heard, the Patronus Yamaha team is taking over two seats from the Angel Nieto Aspar MotoGP team. We know that Franco Morbidelli is going to ride for that. Well, it's not entirely confirmed, but we're 99% sure that Franco Morbidelli is going to be on an M1 next year in MotoGP. However, the other seat is kind of still up for grabs. There's a bunch of people floating around, and we're going to do our top five riders that are going to take that seat alongside Franco Morbidelli. Take it away, Kev. So, the first thing you're going to find out is Bradley fucking Smith is not on this <laughs> list. Okay? Despite the fact that I'm talking about him, he's not on the list. And the reason he's not on the list, despite being floated around everywhere, is that the only reason he's actually floated around is because he's been in GP forever. And one thing I mm -hmm. hate, and it's a trend that has happened forever, is sort of once you're in GP, you're always in GP, right? And you can always use the excuse that, oh, he's a veteran writer, it'll help them you know, set the team up, blah, 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 blah. That's the fucking reason he's even in GP now with KTM. <laughs> so what last thing we want is a guy who's on the grid because he's on the grid. I can't throw out all my nepotism hate for Alex Marquez and all that stuff, but then just be like, it's cool that Smith is on the grid for the sake of being on the grid. Like, Smith races for the same reason the fucking idiot Kardashians are famous. They're famous for being famous. Smith races because he races. You see what I'm saying? That's the only reason he's there. At some point, we have to cut the cycle. We have to end the cycle of abuse that is Bradley Smith's uh, 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 location on the grid. So that being said, you will not find Bradley Smith on this list. You have a better chance of finding seven hairs on his head than you will finding Bradley Smith on this <laughs> list. I will say there's a slightly better chance of finding him on the grid next year than finding him on this list. Yeah. Well, oh, he's so sad about that. All right. Number five. I'm taking number five. Number five for me is Danny Pedrosa. So you're all you're all already thinking, oh, Danny's going to retire. Like, he's not going to race next year. He did terrible at the previous round. I don't give a shit. I want to see Danny Pedrosa on the the satellite Yamaha, the Patronus Sepang International Circuit Yamaha next year. Simply because he's never done it. I want to see Soriano's Law, which is that Danny Pedrosa will retire and sp will have spent his whole career on the Repsol Honda and will retire with that same team. I want to see that law violated, that law completely broken. I tried to make a Wikipedia for that law like a couple days ago. It was too much work. I didn't do it, but it's going down. Um, no, it's just there's there's a lot of intrigue over whether or not Danny Pedrosa can ride another motorcycle better than how he's doing on the Honda right now. Uh, we know that the RCV has kind of become the Marquez specific bike. You have to ride it very similar to his riding style. You have to be aggressive on the brakes in order to get anything out of the bike. And I wouldn't say that Danny Pedrosa is that sort of rider. Cal Crutchlow has become that sort of rider, but Danny has really never been there. So I do think that he'll be faster on an M1. I think that he'll bring something to the championship. He's a very popular rider. I want to see him ride that bike. I, so, I, I should have been showing pictures here of Danny, but uh, but I'm dropping the ball while I'm talking. Dropping the ball big time. That's okay. That's what Rob does. His balls are too big to hold up. Uh, number four that I'll get into while Rob can post those pictures is Scotty O'Hooligan himself, uh, Mr. Scott Redding. I'm a big fan of Redding taking the seat for a dip for some people would say, oh, it's the same reason you just hated on Bradley Smith. And it's not necessarily untrue, <laughs> right? Redding has ridden a variety of bikes. A he brings some stability uh, to a team in the sense that he he's ridden the tires, he's ridden the series, he's more of a known and he's a baseline to get caught up. But he um a, he wants it. He posted it on Twitter. He retweeted. He basically said he'd take the ride for free. He just wants a competitive bike. That dude still has the fire, still wants to ride, still wants to be out there on something he feels he can push. I felt from the get-go, Red had unfinished business. We even did a uh, nice little, uh, what was it, Beneath the Rubber episode on Scott Redding. And the number one thing that's held him back, in my opinion, his whole career is poorly timed moves to teams. And I think hopefully this could be a, a well-timed move, um, especially if the team is going to have much closer connection to Yamaha and with that you, you've seen some comments on the internet um, plus he's entertaining as fuck and the idea that Redding won't be on the grid next year it just hits me right here man right here 
And I don't <laughs> I don't mean hissy right here on front of this nice Bro GP shirt, which we have extra largest still available of. But what I mean is in the heart, <laughs> right in the cockles. Uh, to see him not on the grid doing his crazy reading stuff, uh, as he posted on Twitter himself, he's pretty much one of the realest guys out there. And uh, I'm not interested in the grid becoming more corporate, more watered down, and more censored. So I'm definitely picking number four. Scott Redding as a combination of both a uh, uh, potential and writer um, fan fandom. To your to your point, the uh, Aprilia boss was at the World Superbike round, and he pretty much just said that World Superbike is missing personalities, and that's why it's struggling so much. It's right. missing big personalities, which is totally and, true. Course, he, he, yeah, he also talked about Redding, and you know they had to ditch him because they couldn't let Unoni get away. But that's uh, that's beside the point. I mean, yeah, he is the king of the worst timing possible in MotoGP. Right. So I'd like to see him take advantage of a, of a new team on a bike where hopefully Yamaha learns from its lessons, gets a little tighter factory support to that team. Petronas is obviously a massive, uh, you know, international, um, o, you know, oil giant. They have the money. They're committed to the series. They have Moto2 and Moto3 teams. Uh, it's backed by one of the best, most well-attended tracks on the circuit. It's a Pang International Circuit. I, de- I just think it would be a well-timed move for him uh, in a sea of poorly timed moves. The first one. The only one. All right. One. The only one. All right. My number three is Lorenzo Baldessari. So let me let me grab a photo of him. Where Where is he in my list? Oh, no. He's on your oh, no, I'm dropping the ball. I sent Here you those go. in, in, in big picture, in <laughs> big groups, Rob. Those were in mass, but mass connections so you could do this. I have so many here. I have so many here. I got to find them. No. All right. So Lorenzo Baldessari, if if we're if there's one thing that we both like, it's uh, bringing up talent from the lower classes. Right. They put in the effort. They show good results. They need to come up like we we get to know these racers in the middle class and even in the lower class. We find that like that's where they become popular. That's where we get to know them and we want to see them in GP. So he's my number three pick. Um, He obviously has very strong ties to the VR46 Academy and there are amazingly strong rumors that Valentino Rossi will take over this team when the SIC sort of contract is up in three years. We know that Franco Morbidelli also has very strong ties to uh, VR46. They're both part of their riders. Rossi trains them. They ride Yamahas together. All three of those guys being on M1s next year would make for a really a three really talented Italians in the entire class rabidly popular uh in malaysia mm-hmm. indonesia area obviously patronus's home base valentino any association with valentino is obviously uh, a welcome <laughs> uh a welcome uh, you know addition to the team as well yeah so i mean and lorenzo like he his career isn't star-studded right he had one podium before or two podiums before this year uh last year had a bunch like a few dns's a bunch of retirements not great results but he's finally got his training down he's finally putting his results together he now has two podiums and one win this year um and unfortunately didn't he he had a flat tire in the last round which really upset him boom um but but yeah like if, if we're going to take a chance on someone, like obviously all the other talents from Moto2 are effectively already signed to MotoGP. If we're going to take a chance on someone, I want to see Balda coming through. Uh, I'm going to respectfully disagree and go to our number two or perhaps our tied number three. Speaking of taking a chance on a Moto2 rider who's found his form this year, Fabio motherfucking Quattararo is what I'm saying. Oh, really? He has uh, very <laughs> similar results uh, to Baldessari, very similar stories significantly better hair though uh so that i'm gonna have to say that puts him over the top no for me i'm i've been a fan of fabio for a while you know there was all that talk that he's the next rossi and all that shit you saw when he was in cev he never quite worked it out he struggled a little bit but uh on the speed up he's really come to form he you know he got that win and you saw it you know how fucking jacked he was when he got that win. You know, he was like basically fighting his crew chief in Park Ferme. Falls it up a second <laughs> place. He's got an exciting Ryan style. He's still incredibly young. He's only like 19. So as someone who can still learn and adapt and move on, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Fabio. I like it because it's kind of like that that Jack Miller sort of uh, big ass gamble, right? We're going to take this kid. He just showed up and they put him on the bike. Let's just bring him up and see what happens. Um, for me, I like Fabio. I think his riding style will mesh well if you look at him. I think he's young enough to continue to adapt. He's shown he has the speed. He's, uh, you know, he won on a speed up 
uh, you know, and then followed up the second podium. So we're not really sure how good he actually is because he is winning on what you would consider inferior equipment to someone like Miguel Alvera, Pekka Benyai, Alex Marquez, and all of that. Uh, and yet mm-hmm. that wasn't a fluke win. He followed it up. He looks good. He seems reinvigorated. And momentum and confidence is everything. You know, you don't want to sign a guy who's got some wins but then languished for a year and then just comes up, right? Uh, You want to sign someone who's on the upward trend, just like you said with younger guys. We want upward trend people to to move up and keep pushing the pace and challenging. I do think this last year and a half or so has definitely shown that there's going to be a paradigm shift in the grid. Hence, Danny's not number one. We're not even sure if he's going to get the ride anymore. Uh, There's a lot of rumblings. In fact, there's a lot of serious rumblings that it's going to be Fabio. But uh, what you see here is kind of like a general cleaning of the grid and of the view and a lot of new guys coming up. Joan Mir, only one year, Moto 2, he jumps up. Uh, you know, they didn't even want Jorge, you know, because they wanted Mir at Suzuki. You know, Jorge ended up moving over to, to Repsol last-ditch effort. So I think you're seeing a lot of teams want the young potential and to see what they can do with it. I think Fabio is exactly that. Yeah, I mean, if we're if we're having to choose between guys that only have one win in Moto Two, there's a bunch of people that we can choose there's from. Nothing worse and... than choosing between guys. <laughs> 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 yeah, I had to go there. All right, I lost my train of thought. No, no what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, no, let's uh, let's move on to our number one pick. So this one this one's a little weird for us because I feel like we generally go with the young talent, bring in someone new, but instead our number one pick is Michael Vandermark. Woo! Mikey Mike. Mikey Mike, Marky Mark, and the Funky Mark. Bunch. <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, he's been a longtime Yamaha rider. He brought them their first wins in their resurgence back in, in, in World Superbike. He did the double. He's gotten a couple podiums. He's consistently fast. I think early on I made a joke that, uh, you know, Johnny Ray showed us why he, he, he um, you know, it would do okay in MotoGP. And then, and then uh, Michael Vandenberg showed us why he should be in MotoGP. I think that decide the fact from his passport and his, his, uh, his nationality would fit for MotoGP well. The, the kid is fast. He's still young. He brought them their first uh, wins. He's connected to Yamaha. He's even wild carded already. He has some semblance of riding that bike and what's going on with it. And, I mean, we look back. Yamaha traditionally had, or tr- World Superbike and uh, MotoGP traditionally did well when a Yamaha rider who did the double then moves over the next year uh, ends up doing pretty well. That's Cal Cutchlow. Uh, that worked out for him. What, you know, multiple podiums with Yamaha, factory rider with Ducati, couple, you know, multi-time winner with Honda. I see some parallels if he's on the up and up again. I, you know, I'm not looking at someone like Tom Sykes who's on the downslope of his career, someone like Marco Landry who's on the downslope of his career, or even someone like Chaz Davis who isn't. Really really like on an up or down slope and just kind of maintaining where he's at. <laughs> Vandermark is on that upslope. He's connected with Yamaha and uh, nationality passport wise. It's also an interesting fit for the series. Yeah. I mean, the kid's only 25 years old, so I feel like I can say the kid. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I can't remember what the previous other factory to do the double in world Superbike bike was but besides if you're not a kawasaki or ducati who else did a double and when was it it was probably six years ago like an aprilia right. or something yeah, right? it was, it was like, probably aprilia with laverty you know years and years ago yeah it's true you i know? mean or maybe marco melandri on the yamaha way right. back in the day too so yeah so to see vandermark put those two solid results together and then to even have yamaha and vandermark follow that up with podiums and and yamaha followed up with another one with lows right there Yamaha's putting the effort over there. Vandermark is giving them the results. And I think that if he doesn't end up re-signing for the team, a good spot for him is in GP. Um, we don't often talk about bringing people over just because, like we said initially, there aren't uh, there aren't too many personalities in World Superbike that we think are actually re- worthy of being in MotoGP. But Vandermark is definitely one of them. He's young. He's right. exciting. People want to see him race. You know Asin would go nuts if he was in GP more, more so than they than do usual. now. Right. Yes, exactly. So, uh, yeah, he is our number one. Um, do I think it's actually going to happen? Mm, I don't know, Kev. What do you say? If I was a betting man, I'm going with Fabio. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah, I, I was a betting Danny, man as well. Danny's result last race, I think, was the nail in the coffin. Uh, he was linked to it, but he's on in such an extreme downslope. You know, he kind of reminds me of guys like Chuck Liddell and boxers, you know, MMA fighters who, who once they've been knocked out one, two times, it's just done. He just simply can't be on, you know, he can't 
be healthy. He's constantly injured. I don't think the fire is there anymore. And I think that you talk about moving the amount of motivation you have to have to move to a brand new team on a satellite and really push those results is not something that someone like Danny has anymore. Not when you've been racing and winning since 2006. I think what you have to do as a new team is get someone young and hungry to advance yourself because otherwise it's just not going to happen. You have to find someone whose motivation continues after every result. And I, I think you put yeah, Danny mean, on that bike. If it doesn't work out well right away, like we all talk about, is he, oh, I'd love to see him on the Yamaha. But, dude, if it sucks three or four races in, you know he's just over it. <laughs> that is true. It's a, it's a big risk there to get some enjoyment out of it. I mean, and that's a risk that it, I think the team would be okay with taking just for the marketability of Danny Pedrosa, right? Even if he is barely getting top tens, he's still a very popular rider. Um, a lot of Europe loves him, and, and I would like to see him there because of it. But, I mean, I feel like I feel like other teams have done that for, for even riders like Nicky Hayden in the past. You know, you have one young, hungry rider, and then you have your market marketable guy that, uh, that sells tickets too so <clears throat> but um yeah so yeah i think uh i think the timing of this episode is on purpose uh or this video uh i think we fully expect danny pedrosa to announce his retirement on thursday right. um the yeah the sic patronus yamaha kind of memo already came out that they're in, they have an agreement with yamaha and that aspar is essentially handing over their grid spots to them and uh yeah we're gonna hear more about this soon and right. definitely uh, not related at all to the sort of money laundering uh, accusations that that team has all of a sudden <laughs> <laughs> definitely not wink not wink. related wink wink nudge <laughs> nudge all right, everyone, I'm planning on doing a tech tape here in another couple of days, so we're probably not going to do a World Superbike episode because if you already watched race one, mm, mm, whatever, go ch go cares? check it out. Maybe something interesting Real talk, will happen in race two. I didn't even two. know there was a World Superbike race today. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I, just, I just woke up. I was sleepy Kev on the, on the login. I literally was sleeping. Rob's like, you watched World Superbike? I'm like, did I watch what? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and they're at Misano too. And it rained right. for a little bit, but not during the race. Whatever. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, like, share, and subscribe to this video. And uh, we will catch you shortly. Peace.